years ago, uh, we, my family lived in Southern California for a little while. We went to Disneyland as a family day, and my daughter was about three or four years old at the time, and, you know, there's a thing there where they can drive the cars on the, you know, the little turnpike thing or whatever, and you know, she was nervous because in her mind, I was being an incredibly irresponsible dad to let a three-year-old or four-year-old get behind the wheel of a car, even if it's a small car. It just didn't seem like the responsible thing. But I kind of wanted her to have the sense of responsibility and maybe a little fear that made the ride fun. And so I didn't explain too much to her. Uh, And she was driving. You can see the tenseness. And then she began to realize that the metal thing in the middle of the road was, you know, keeping ultimately the control. And she realized she didn't have as much control over the steering that she originally thought. And in her life, that brought a sense of relief. It brought a sense of kind of a peace. She could enjoy the ride and, and not feel like things that were way beyond her ability were still something she had to control, all of it. I don't know about you. How do you handle those things in your life when you realize your circumstances in your life, good circumstances, but, but the bad circumstances in your life, that you realize you're not in control as much as you want or as much as you thought? Those things that you can't control, does that bring anxiety? Does that bring a sense of anger? Does that bring something negative? Or does it kind of bring a sense of, you know what, a peace that that you don't have to control it? The story that we're going to look at here in Acts chapter 12 is the story of this miraculous freeing of Peter from prison. But another thing we can see in the story is that as we catch kind of the truth that it reveals This story kind of shows us a way we can kind of be free from another kind of prison in our life as well. Let's just get into the story. It's in chapter 12 of Acts, verse 1. Luke says it was about this time, and Bible scholars tell us this is about 44 AD, so we're about 14 years after the death of Jesus. It was about this time that King Herod, I put that in yellow because the next sermon is going to be about the rest of this chapter, and it's about Herod. It's a really interesting story. Keith is going to talk about that next Sunday. So come back next Sunday for that. I think you won't be disappointed. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, this church of Christians in Jerusalem, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now James, this James, is not the same James that the chapter is going to talk about later. The the later James is the half-brother of Jesus. But this James here is the brother of John. It was, remember, if you read the Gospels, it was Peter, James, and John that were the inside circle of Jesus' 12 disciples. They got to be a part of the more privileged miracles that Jesus did, raising a woman, a girl from the dead, seeing Jesus transfigure to this bright, shining uh, self-existence. And so the others didn't get to see that. So this is the James that was kind of one of the three big apostles and it says that he had him put to death with a sword means that he was beheaded, not, not run through with a sword, but beheaded with a sword. So when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, not talking about ethnic Jews, but, but the leaders of the Jewish people, he proceeded to seize Peter also. So the next of the big three, let's go for one, number two, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded We're not going to let him get away by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after Passover. He couldn't try him legally during Passover, so he's going to put him in prison and then the next day have him executed. And so Luke kind of then kind of sets up the story in verse 5 when he says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying, for God, praying to God for him. And then Luke tells this story that I think could be a great scene in a movie, especially the way he tells it. It's at night, and it's the night before Peter's going to be tried and executed. It's going to, we all know where the trial is going to go, the sentencing is going to go. But Peter's asleep. And I don't know. Maybe he was tired, but maybe he just sort of had this kind of faith by now in God that he didn't have to stress, even though he was going to be killed the next day, all likelihood. He, could, he was deeply asleep, we'll find out. He was really hard asleep, and yet he's chained. Both arms, Luke tells us, are chained. 
and maybe to the, he said there was a guard on his left and his right, so maybe, the, maybe he's kind of chained to their arm as well, or maybe he's chained to something on the bench. But either way, he's chained on both arms, and he's got a guard at both arms. And all of a sudden, you know, he's sleeping, and you just imagine this night scene. Torches on the wall, but it's dark. There's no city lights. You might hear a dog barking way in the distance. And you can just kind of, it's you know, around March or April, and you can kind of feel spring in the wind, and it's at night, and all of a sudden an angel appears, and he shines bright in the cell, Luke tells us. And he, nobody's watching him. Somehow the guards are asleep too, so we can kind of assume that somehow with Jedi mind tricks, I don't know, the guards are sleeping. And it says that the chains all of a sudden by themselves came off of Peter. And the angel just punches him in the side because Peter's hard asleep. And he says, quick, get up. Get your sandals on. Get your clothes on. Get your coat on and follow me. And it says that Peter's kind of like, wait, what? He's in a daze, but he does all that. He puts his sandals on, his clothes on, his coat on, and he follows the angel out of the cell. Somehow these guards are sleeping. And then it says he goes by the first guard on the outside and didn't get seen, didn't get stopped. He was able to walk right by him. Goes by the second guard. Same thing, didn't get stopped. And all of a sudden, they're starting to make their way to the gate that goes out to the city, and the gate opens by itself. And they walk through the gate, and they walk as far as a block away, and then the angel leaves. And Peter comes to his senses and realizes, wait a minute, I just, I just got busted out of prison by an angel. And he's standing there, and it says, that in verse 12, Luke tells us that he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. So this isn't the apostle John. This is a John they also called Mark. He's going to end up writing the gospel of Mark. His mom owned a house that seemed to be a big meeting place for the Jerusalem Christians, so much so that Peter knew to go there when he got freed from prison. So they went to the house where many people had gathered and were praying. I don't know what time of night this was, but still they're they're praying. And then it it gets kind of comical because it says then in the next verse, it says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance. So this is a big house and it's kind of, you know, she's a woman of means. And so she has this outer entrance. It's like a courtyard between the house and the outer entrance. It's not a fence. You can't see through it. It's a door that you can't see through. But Peter is knocking on that gate. He's knocking on that door. And so it says a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. This is really interesting because when historians tell us when they go back and read documents of antiquity, how do you tell if something is an eyewitness account versus some sort of myth that's made up? Well, one of the big signs they say you can tell is an eyewitness account are details that aren't integral to the story. We've talked about this before. But Rhoda, the name of the servant, I mean, that doesn't advance the story at all, except it just lets us know that her name was remembered and recorded by all the eyewitnesses of this account. She's a servant named Rhoda. Nobody else, except for the mother who owns the house, nobody else is mentioned in this story by name. But Luke mentions her name. And it says, she came to answer the door when she recognized Peter's voice. She knew Peter. She could recognize his voice. Now, she can't see him, but she recognized his voice. She was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaim, Peter's at the door. So you just got to picture this scene. Peter just got broke out of prison by an angel. It's dark out, but he's kind of running for his life. He's still, they're wanting to kill him. So he's knocking at the door and he's trying to get in and she just you know, doesn't open the door, but so excited she runs back in. So he's still outside. She runs back in and it even gets more bizarre. It gets more comical. And you know, really the only explanation for what we're reading right now is that it really happened. And it's really true to, it's true to life. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't, this is not the stuff that a myth would be. This is stuff that describes human behavior. It goes on and Luke says, they said to her, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. That's one of the strangest verses in the Bible. Here they are denying, oh, come on, you're crazy. It's not Peter, he's in prison. It's gotta be his angel. Wait, what? That's, a, that's less of a miracle? That it's his angel and not Peter? And, you know, when, whenever un, unnamed people in the Bible say something, 
you don't have to take their theology as God's word. That, that's just what they believe. That's what they said. But they're unnamed. It's not something we have to believe now that Peter had an angel. That's not it. But they said it because it does seem, Jesus did say something in Matthew chapter 18 that was along those lines when he said that the people, his people's angels are in the presence of God, that somehow there's angels assigned to his people. That might be where that kind of came from. Or this is written in Greek, and it's weird, you know, languages translate differently based on context, but the Greek word for angel is the exact same word for messenger. So a lot of times in your English Bible, you'll read the word messenger, but that's the same word that gets translated here as angel. So it might be, they, trans- they had to make a choice, but it might be that they said, no, it's a messenger from him. It's not Peter, it's his messenger. Let's, let's go find out what he wants to say. But here's the thing. They're inside arguing. They're inside insulting the servant girl. You're crazy, you're out of mind, out of your mind. And they said it must be his angel, but Peter kept knocking. He's outside, he's still knocking, it's still going on. Uh, they could solve this argument really easily if they just go open the door. It's something like a Paul McCartney song. But when Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Like, really? I mean, it, you had, I don't know what they expected, but they're, it says, Luke says, they're praying to God earnestly. They're even staying up late at night praying to God earnestly because Peter is in prison. But then when you know, they're praying for God to work, when God does work, the first response they have is it seems to be unbelief. It's just such a contradiction to what we're seeing. They're praying earnestly for God to work. When God works, their response is unbelief. And it's just sort of that picture you see in all the Bible, this sort of baked-in reality of God's people are always a mixed bag. It's just a mixture of belief and unbelief. In the earliest Christians, we've seen this in other stories we've talked about here in going through the the book of Acts. And we see it here. The people that had this faith enough to be praying earnestly to God in the middle of the night also kind of have an unbelief that makes them spout off and ridicule the servant girl when she says God did this. And it's a kind of unbelief that when they see Peter, they're astonished. It's one of those things where faith kind of plays out in people's lives differently. But one of the ways that faith plays out in the life of everybody who is becoming spiritually mature, that's growing in their relationship with God, the way faith plays out in their life, it's always this, eventually, this never perfect faith, always mixed with unbelief, but there's this growing sense of this awareness that God is 100% present, he's 100% focused without being any less present or focused anywhere else because he's infinite, and that he's in control of everything that happens. Now, that needs to be nuanced, what that means and what it doesn't mean. We don't have time for that here, but that God is ultimately in control of everything that is happening and that he is always good. I don't have to control everything. I can have this sense of entrusting to God everything, and I can have this sense that he is good. That was the picture that Jesus wanted his disciples to have of God. When he says in Matthew chapter 10, it's one of the Bible's greatest hits, I think, because I say it a lot, and it's one of these most comforting passages, at least for me in my faith. Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? So sparrows were so plentiful. If you wanted a sparrow, you can buy two of them for a penny. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Not even a sparrow will die, will fall to the ground. Now, they fall to the ground, for sure. Every sparrow dies, but none of them dies outside of God's attention, outside of God's care, control. Uh, Again, these words are, there's not a perfect word, maybe, but outside of God's care, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God is so intimately involved in the details, not just of sparrows, but of you. So don't be afraid, he says. Somehow Jesus is drawing a picture of God that if you had it, you would have less anxiety, you would have less worry, you would have less fear, not perfectly less, mixed bag, but don't be afraid, you're worth more than many sparrows. Not worthy, but you're worth more 
than many sparrows, that God is intimately involved in control. And so in one sense, if we take this teaching of Jesus and we come back to Acts 12, we kind of have this thing where in one sense, what we see in this story shows us what we don't see. What we see in this story shows us what we don't see, and that is we're not seeing all the miracles. We don't have these chains falling off, gates open by themselves, going by people and they're not noticing us. But just the same, somehow, in all the thousands of ways that harm can come to you and, and, and evil could happen to you, that God is mostly in your life protecting and guarding you from that. Now, there come a time when the sparrow falls, for sure in your life. But until then, God is guarding you and protecting you, and you have no idea. You're going through life, and you're sort of thinking life is on your own, and you're controlling things, but the very breath you're breathing comes from God. The very heartbeat your heart is beating comes from God. Not just that, but that just all the circumstances of your life, God is doing things in your life far more than you realize. That's the picture Jesus had, and that's the picture he wanted his disciples to have. And I think this picture that we're seeing is kind of a dramatized version of, of a seen version of the reality of it not being seen. But I think this story also shows us what to do when almost all the time we run into those circumstances in our life that are not in our control. But we really care about them. I mean, they really matter, but we're not in control of them. What, what, do, we, what do we do? When that happens, well, this is what Luke tells us they did. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I think there's a sense in which God brings difficult circumstances, bad circumstances in our life that we realize we're not in control, that force us either to have two kinds of responses. We can get, we can get angry or, or anxious worry, or the other response is we could, I mean, it's always going to mix bag, but the other response is we can turn to him and pray to him because we realize, oh, okay, God, I need you in my life to do this. Now, you know, it's one of those things where if you think about it, what God knows you need more than anything you're praying about, what he knows you really need more than anything you think you need he knows what you really need is the one thing you can't live without, and that's him. He knows what you really need is this bigger story, this forever story that he has for your life, all the pieces fitting together, you have no idea, but you have to have him to have that. And so he's bringing things your way to kind of force you to pray and to pray more earnestly because that's how you connect with God. This is the and we don't like it, but this is always usually the path that people who have really developed this peace with God, this calm confidence with God, this relationship with God, can point to the times in their life where they had circumstances where they had no choice but to trust in God. Because God wants to give you him. Because he is what you really need. Now, think about it in your life. When something's happened that's bad enough and, and not in your control enough, when do you pray the most? Do you pray the most when things are going well? Do you pray more earnestly when things are great? Mm. Or do you pray more and more earnestly when it's bad and you're not in control and God's the only, only one? And you can respond in anxiety and fear, and we all deal with that. That's not a 100% either way. But what the Bible's telling us and what Jesus is trying to get us to do is to see that God is our Father in heaven who cares about every detail. He's always present. He's always focused He's always in control uh, to where the, not even a sparrow falls to the ground, the numbers of hairs of our head, all that kind of stuff. And you can trust that he is good. He is your good father, Jesus is saying. So don't be afraid. You're worth more to God than any of that. But there's this sense if it, also here in Acts, and you can have that peace of knowing that, but what we also see here in Acts is that it, it really mattered that they prayed. I mean, the way Luke describes the story, it, it just seems like it was a real direct correlation. Peter's in prison. The church is praying earnestly for him. And then this happens. Oh, you, you can't not see the connection. And so you, you, you leave the story saying, boy, it seems to have really mattered 
that they prayed. And, and it matters that you and I pray. It matters, especially in those things that we can't control. It matters that we pray far more than we think, I think. Here's a question. What if? What if God only did miraculously? Now, I don't think this is true. I think God's always working miraculously in ways, like I said before, that we don't always see. But what if God only did what he does miraculously in your life according to what, how you pray for it, as a response to your prayer? Yeah, now everybody's dying up here. I don't know how you all are doing back there. But, but, but let's say if God only did what you asked him to do in your life, what would he do? How much would he do? And I don't know, because I wonder that when I read, like in Mark chapter 6, where Jesus goes to his hometown, and they kind of have a hardened heart toward him, and he says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. And then it says that Jesus, Mark says, Jesus couldn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Jesus couldn't do many miracles. This is Mark 6, verses 5 through 6. He couldn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. I, think, I just think it's something to think about, but then there's also this reality that this chapter shows us, and that is sometimes we pray and we pray earnestly, but God doesn't answer our prayers. Sometimes what we don't want to have happen, and we trust God and we come to God earnestly, but it still happens. And we all know that, right? And Luke is not trying to hide that at all. It's the second verse, second sentence we read. He says in verse two, Herod had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Just a real quick sentence. I mean, just matter of fact, end of story. My guess is James prayed too. My guess is James, when he's in prison, he knows he's gonna be beheaded. He's praying earnestly. And James is not some person that didn't have a connection with Jesus. He was one of the three intimate inside apostles, just like Peter. And yet he, just one story, yeah, James got put to death with a sword. You know, for James, there's no angels appearing in the darkness. There's no chains falling off his arms automatically. There's no guards kind of kept unaware while he walks out and gates opening for him and he ends up out of, not for James. All it is for James is this disciple of Jesus was this brutal beheading in spite of his praying earnestly. And then for Peter is this, is this miraculous deliverance, this freedom from, from prison. And you know, just Christians, God's people have always had to deal with the mystery that we were, Diego was reading a Psalm 77, the, the, the psalmist is dealing with that mystery himself, that we've always had to deal with this mystery. We don't really know the whys, but that sometimes God doesn't do what we think he would do if he was loving and good and active and present and caring and all these kinds of things that Jesus said he is, but it doesn't go that way and we get confused. But the story the Bible doesn't hide the fact that sometimes it just, God's not going to answer your prayer. Because again, remember, he's giving you him and his bigger story for your life as the number one thing he knows you need. But it is interesting. The time that Jesus prayed this, the only other time this phrase that Luke uses, that they prayed earnestly, the only other time that word earnestly is used in describing prayer in the Bible is the other time it's used is in Luke chapter 22, verses 42 through 44, actually verse 44, when Jesus is going to be crucified. It's the night before he's going to be, be crucified. It's the night he's going to be arrested, and Jesus all of a sudden is overwhelmed with fear and overwhelmed with anxiety. And the Bible's really super honest about this, and he's so overwhelmed with anxiety of what he knows is about to happen, he prays to God that, it, that just God would find another way. Always, I know this was a plan, but is there another way? Let's just read it, where Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. That meant the suffering he was about to undergo. Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, we all kind of know the rest of the story, but it says, in being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. There's that word. The only time this word is used. So just like they prayed earnestly in Acts chapter 12, Jesus prayed earnestly too. 
and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground, but we all know the story it ends. God didn't take away the cup. Now, Jesus knew that what he wanted more than anything, what was most important was God's will, not his. And we don't always catch that. We don't always you know, trust that. But this is an example of a prayer that was not answered, a prayer of Jesus that was not answered by God the Father. So if there's a time when God doesn't answer Jesus' prayer, my guess is there are going to be times when he doesn't answer our prayer either, just like with James, put to death with the sword. But Jesus knew that what's most important is having this connection with the Father and being part of his bigger story. I think that challenges all of us. I want to close with this, that this, this, this video that I saw last couple weeks ago on the internet, you know, the, the, the technology Peter Jackson developed for this uh, World War I film where they took film from over 100 years ago and restored it, colorized it, made it look like kind of video now. So you can look back at film. This is right here, an example right here. We can look back at film. This was over 120 years ago, men playing a, a game in Lyon, France, and, you know, this is, this is 120 years ago, just seeing what life is like. This is in Jerusalem in 1897. This is what people were doing on a day at a time in life in 1902 in New York City. This is what's going on in the Caribbean in 1899, just a day in the life of people who lived 120 years ago, Barcelona in 1896, you know, did goofing around the same way we goof around when they see a camera. And the, just the kind of stuff that's going on here, kids playing in the street in Vietnam, guy coming by, kind of reaches out and kind of does a little fun with the kid there. People were people then, just like they're people now. And they're living their life in 1899 in London. And when I just see that, it just, it just dawns on me. Everybody that was alive then is dead now. And nobody alive now knew them or remembers them or cares about them. Everybody whose life was so important 100 years ago, there's, they're all dead. And there's nobody alive now that knew them or remembers them. It's kind of cool to see the video, but I, I have no idea who these people are. You don't either. And you know what? 100 years from now, everybody in this room is going to be dead. Everybody 120, let's just make it for real. Everybody 120 years from now is going to be dead. And nobody alive 120 years from now will have known you or remember you or care. And, and, and whatever it is right now that makes you anxious and, and that you, you, you get angry about and anxious about, it won't matter to anybody 120 years from now. And you know what? It won't matter to you either. What will matter to you most, and I'll just end with this, 100 years, 1,000 years from now, what will matter to you most won't be any of the things that you worry about now. None of them. It will be whether or not you have had God in your life and that you are part of his bigger story that Jesus knew was worth it to say, not my will, but yours be done. Amen.